communicator of the gospel. Thank you for praying for us this past week. The Lord was with us in obvious ways. I want you to turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I was looking back over sermons, and I, it's, we've had different things coming up. Uh, we had Mother's Day, we, uh, we had Memorial Day weekend, we had uh, some friends come in to bring us up to speed on the Haiti Collective, uh, Father's Day, Lord's Supper. Well, it's been about a month since we've been in uh, 1 Corinthians, we're going through this under the overarching theme, the, the perfect gospel for an imperfect church. If you've been tracking with us, you know that Paul makes it plain from the very early verses of this letter to the church at Corinth that he is vexed with their divisive spirit that he claims is debilitating and undermines their witness and undermines their mission and their ministries. And he's still doing this. He's still talking about this when we get to chapter 4, uh, verses 6 to 13. Remember when we looked at chapter 4, verses 1 to 5, God's looking for, for servants, stewards of the gospel. Well, today, as Paul continues addressing this matter of, of them choosing up their favorite preacher, uh, juxtaposed against, with the implication being, if I follow Paul, then then I don't think much of Peter or Apollos, <clears throat> and, and as it went around like that. He's still dealing with this, and he talks about this, this necessity of evangelical humility. Humility and pride are contrasted in this passage, which they should be because they are polar opposites. They, they cannot dwell uh, simultaneously in the same heart. 1 Corinthians 4, 6 to 13, I want to ask you if you would to, to stand with me. Follow along. If you found that in your Bible, if you don't have a Bible with you, see us after the service. We want to help you get your own copy, but we'll put the text on the screen for you. In the meantime, I want you to see. It's important that you see the Word of God that you hear it, I remind you one of the reasons that every Sunday we gather for morning worship, we read responsibly, is I want to be sure that the Bible is not a silent book to you, that you are verbalizing the words of Scripture. It'll, it'll make it increasingly likely that you will out loud quote Scripture or cite Scripture when you're talking with people along the way. 1 Corinthians 4, <clears throat> 6-13 Paul says, I have applied all these things, that he's been telling them here, to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. It's clear right there. The idea of puffed up being arrogant, prideful, one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. It's getting sarcastic here, and if you know Paul's writings, particularly in 2 Corinthians, well, yeah, there's a tone of sarcasm that begins to take over to chide them. Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings. And would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands. And when reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. 
an unusual passage. Different tone from Paul than we've been seeing. But we've read it in what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And I pray that today the Lord will help us to see how important it is that we put an ax to the root of any manifestation of pride in our lives and that we strive uh, in the Word with the help of the Holy Spirit to cultivate uh, humility because it's so befitting and it adorns the gospel. Thank you. Please be seated if you would. In 1984, in a Christianity Today issue, uh, Fred Smith, in an article entitled Christian Humility, said this, The best definition of humility I've ever heard is this. Humility is not denying the power you have, but admitting that the power comes through you and not from you. In other words, there's a false humility. Oh, well, I don't know anything. I, I can't do anything. That's a, that's a false humility people take up, and that's not what we're talking about there. We're talking about true evangelical humility. Again, it's not denying the power you have. Because if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have been empowered by the Holy Spirit. You've been born again. He is dwelling in you, sanctifying you, growing you in grace, <clears throat> conforming you increasingly to the likeness of Jesus Christ. So it's not denying the power that you have, but it's recognizing the source. It, it doesn't come from you, but it comes through you. And this, Paul's really been dealing with this, hasn't he, about, about them acting with worldly wisdom, them taking up the ways of the world, rather than, rather than living as people uh, endowed by the Spirit. Conversely, pride. It's, a, it's an improper an excessive self-esteem manifested and in, in termed in the Scripture as conceit or arrogance. If you read Paul in 2 Corinthians 7, you'll, he'll, he'll use the word in a positive way about, about what we would call a justified pride in, in the things of God and, and what God is doing in Paul's case, what God is doing through people he ministered to. But that's not what's in view here. Most Frequently in the scripture, when pride is mentioned by name or by one of these synonyms, conceit and arrogant, it is sinful. Just for your information, there are, uh, there are ten Hebrew and two Greek words generally used for pride, and they typically refer to being high or exalted in attitude. It's the opposite virtue, it's the opposite of the virtue of humility. Pride is, a, is an ego unchecked. Often manifests itself in someone who gives the appearance of a substance, but is filled with hot air. And this is Paul's term puffed up here that he uses in the text today. It's an attitude of, uh, it's a sin of attitude and of heart and spirit. We're going to look at some passages here in a few moments, how this is used in the Scripture. I want you to see it as we give it as a sort of a background context for the text we're looking at today. Even though it is an attitude and a heart and spirit matter, it seldom stays contained. It often manifests itself in one's speech, boasting, looking down on others, what the scripture is talking about when it talks about haughty eyes. It's uh, eyes that look down on others. God hates those, by the way. The proud look. Treating others contemptibly. The Pharisees did this. If you remember, they, they uh, when they spoke of Jesus, this man, this man hangs around tax collectors and sinners. They, they looked down on them. They looked down on Jesus because he was found among them. And you could go through the Old Testament and study the life of King Uzziah. Had a great start, but pride brought his downfall. Hezekiah. Herod. The Pharisee standing praying, remember? I thank you. You... Father, that I'm not 
Thank you, God, I'm not like this fellow over here. Pride. It's ugly. That's what Paul sees in these Corinthians. I want us to see three things in this text today. First of all, the problem of pride in, in the midst of the Corinthians. Secondly, the contrast of the apostles' conditions. He contrasts that. And the third, this, the necessity of evangelical humility, which, which is implied here, but it's stated in the responsive reading that we read from Philippians 2, from Paul's own pen to the church Philippi. First of all, the problem of pride in the Corinthians, verses 6 to 8. I've applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If you then received it, why do you boast as if you didn't receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, uh, you have become kings. Would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. We're going to look at that. Well, it reminds you that in Proverbs 8, verses 13, tells us that the fear of the Lord, by the way, Jim Ork, if we can get a hold of his uh, messages on Psalm 19 this week, he did one of the best, clearest, I think most, biblically saturated studies of what the fear of the Lord is in Proverbs 19. It's a, it's a great, I commend it to you if we, can, if we can get a hand on it. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance, and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. That's what the Lord speaks. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. In Proverbs 16, 18, you'll know this one. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Both these terms, pride and a haughty spirit. The Bible teaching that, that the, uh, we're warned in the Scripture, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And that the, the language there is the, let him who thinks he stands erect on his own. That's the picture there. Take heed lest he fall, because none of us stand on our own. None of us do. There's some verses I want to share with you about the contrast of the two. Psalm 18, 27. For you save a humble people, but the haughty eyes you bring down. Psalm 147, 6. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Psalm 149, 4. The Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. Proverbs 11, 2. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble... Is wisdom. Remember, Paul's been talking about this, this need for wisdom. Wisdom from on high, the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of the world. He's, he's contrasted these two things in the earlier verses in this letter. Proverbs 3, 34 and 35. Toward the scorners, he is scornful, as God. But to the humble, he gives favor. The wise will inherit honor, but fools get disgrace. Notice the, notice the synonyms begin to cluster around. The scornful, fools. And in the New Testament, you, you have this, James 4, 6 to 10, citing this, God gives more grace. It says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And the word they're opposed in the New Testament is he declares war on the proud. And of course, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, he will flee. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Clean your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and, and mourn, or that, as grieve and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. God's, a, God's in opposition to the proud. First Peter 5, 5 and 6, Likewise, you who are younger... Be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Let's look at what Paul is saying here in verses 6 to 8. He challenges them not to go beyond what is written, not, not to draw their thoughts, their ideas about about uh, what is right from external sources, but to draw them from 
the Word of God, draw them from the preaching of Paul, what he's been teaching them. Uh, and he says, I've applied these things. I'm not telling you something that, that I don't consider. Uh, Paul and Apollos, he, he chooses Apollos as one of the, he remembers, I, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Peter. Well, we follow Christ. That's this party spirit attitude. He says, I've given you the example of myself and Apollos so that you may, that none of you will be puffed up in favor of one against another. Who are these? He's already asked the question. He says, we're just servants. In the previous verses, we're just servants of the Lord. We're just stewards of the mystery. And he asked him this question in verse 7. Who sees anything different in you? In other words, when you take this, when you take this attitude, we're supposed to act and think and speak differently from the world. He says, when you take this attitude, who, who sees anything different in you? you? You look like just another Corinthian. Then he asks again, what do you have that you did not receive? You're, you're acting as if you somehow have, have got this wisdom that's allowed you to recognize that Apollos is a superior preacher to Paul. Or that Peter is more more biblical, more, more, more like Jesus. If you recognize any value in the preaching of Paul or Apollos or Peter, that's been given you by the Lord. It's not something that you, you intuitively, from your own mind, figured out and discovered. We, we talked about this, on, by the way, earlier in here on, in study on, on the difference in inspiration and revelation and illumination. But what he's saying here is... It, when you recognize value in one of these fellows preaching, it's because the Lord has given that to you. Why take that then and use it as if something, something you figured out and that these other poor Corinthians don't know any better than to think that Paul is a better preacher or that Peter is a better preacher. You see what he's saying to them. He says, you, you receive this from the Lord. Not the attitude, but the recognition of the value of gospel preaching and the content of what they say. If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Why, why are you acting as if you have the edge? You're a better discerner of preaching. Let me tell you something. There are preachers that, who, who try to curry the favor of people. You know, you, you know the type when, when folks start, start talking and saying kind things. Oh, no, no, don't say that. No, no, that's not right. Don't say that. You know. But most preachers are not pleased. But Linda will tell you, one, we were in the office one day and this fellow came in. Do you remember this guy, Linda? He came in and wanted to check out a, what our Sunday school classes looked like. I said, well, I said, there are four walls, a door. I want to go look and see where I may be coming. Well, we're well, glad to show you what, he said, well, I'm in a church right now. The preacher doesn't hardly know anything there. I thought, I'm not going there. I said, look, don't, don't talk about other preachers. Don't do that. And finally, the fellow just kept on. We finally just told him, you know, you'd probably be happier somewhere else. Don't play that game. <clears throat> no preacher who's been called by God appreciates being spoken well of in the context of running down another preacher, gospel preacher. And Paul's after this here. And then he turns his tone. He's, he's pressed these questions to them. Verse 8, already you have all you want. He said, you, you clearly, if you're that wise, you don't, you don't need the teaching of other preachers. Already you become rich. He's not talking about financially rich. You, you're, you're so rich in the knowledge and spiritual knowledge. Without us, you become kings. You, you, are, you have anointed yourself as the discerner of that which is good. You... You rule in Corinth in your wisdom, even though he's already told them it's a worldly wisdom, it's not a spiritual wisdom. And then he says, would that you did reign. Now, it would be wonderful if, if, this, if this reigning attitude was one, was one to conquer sin, was one to advance the gospel so that we might share the rule with you. In other words, you're, you're arrogant here. He says, he's going after the arrogance. So, he's addressing the pride that is manifested in 
some of the Corinthians in the church at Corinth. He contrasts that, secondly, uh, with, their, with the apostles' conditions. He said, now, this is kind of funny that you're, that you're fussing and arguing with one another about who's the better. He said, let me tell you what life is like for us. While, you're, while you think you're building us up by choosing one over another, let me tell you what life is like for us. I think God has exhibited us apostles as last of all. He said, you're, you're wanting to stack up favorites. He said, we don't, we don't think in those terms. Like men sentenced to death, he said, let me tell you what it's like to be an apostle in the first century. And by the way, the apostles were martyred to the man. Martyr. We're like men sentenced to death. We become a spectacle. The word spectacle there was used of the, of the conquering uh, generals who would come back from battle. And if they had won the battle, uh, they would come back in, on their chariots and have their, their uh, officers around them. They would lead the, some captives that they took who they planned to execute in the arena. And, and they, would, they would, if they could, if they captured him alive, they would have the opposing king and make a spectacle of him, parading him around behind the chariot. Uh, oftentimes, they would be known to cut off the thumbs of a, of a great warrior to show that he would never hold a sword again to oppose them. Make a spectacle. Paul says, we become a spectacle to the world. Angels, angels watching from heaven are going, that's, that's the men Leading the cause? We're a spectacle to men. He goes on and says, we are fools for Christ's sake. Now, he's, he's told them about being foolish. Uh, the wisdom of the world is, is foolishness to God. He's using the word a little differently here. In other words, people see us as fools for going around preaching a message that, that Jesus of Nazareth was put to death by God and raised from the grave and people say, that's foolishness. That's nonsense. We've never heard anything like that, anything remote to that. We're considered fools for Christ's sake. But you are wise in Christ. You, you think that Christian life is best manifested when you come across looking, looking smarter than other people. He said, we're weak. But you think what you're doing in Corinth, to choose your favorite preacher to the, to the denigration of the others, you think that's strong. You think that makes you look like a mature person. You're held in honor. We in disrepute. The, the picture I have here in my mind is Paul says, you're wanting to go around telling people, well, don't, didn't you recognize the value of what so-and-so preached? There? And, and, oh, wow, you, gosh, you're so discerning. Help us, help us become that discerning. That's what he's going after here. But we're in disrepute. And it's really, the irony here is he's talking about how the world treats him, but for some of those in Corinth, that's how they were treating him. <laughs> they were speaking ill of him. Ah, uh, Paul. You know. The super apostles, by the way, if you go ahead and read 2 Corinthians, there's a group that Paul calls the super apostles. They're, they're Judaizer types who would come in after Paul had been in a place and try to uh, undermine his ministry uh, by offering critiques of them. He calls them these super apostles. Uh, he says, they, they know more than that. They, they, they say, yo, Paul, Paul, man, he, he writes a mean letter, but when he's with you, he's like a little, little cat, a little kitten. He's, he's all, all bark and no bite. That's how they were criticizing Paul. That's why he spent a good deal of his time defending his ministry, and he, and he will say in 2 Corinthians, I know I'm sounding like a fool here, but, but I've got to do that to get your attention to what's, what's being, how your head's being messed up by these folks that have come in behind me to undermine the work that God called me to do there. He's not that far into it yet in 1 Corinthians, but when you read 2 Corinthians, he's, he's gotten pretty steamed. Verse 11, to the present hour, you're sitting there uh, throwing accolades all over, so the present hour... We hunger and thirst. We're poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. We labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. He's talking about going with their, their attitude now, their verbal attitude. When someone speaks ill of us, 
we speak blessing to them. Persecuted, we don't complain, we endure. And slandered, when spoken ill of, we entreat. And that's what Paul sees himself doing right here. Is he is entreating the Corinthians to put this nonsense down and back away and say, you know something? God blessed us with Paul planting this church. He blessed, blessed us with Apollos coming in behind and, and laboring here. He blessed us with Peter coming in different styles. Jim Scott Oreck, whom we heard preach this past week at camp, has a very different style, but it's a very compelling style. He's a, he's a professor of humanities at the Boyce College at, South, at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville. And, uh, our, in fact, our, our own faith, uh, Stinson Taylor, uh, took him for every class that he offered there and would tell us often, she, that was his, her favorite professor. He remembered her, spoke fondly of her. But he, he's a storyteller in a powerful way. He doesn't preach like I do. Very effective. Paul's saying, we're entreating you to stop this preacher worship. Because preacher worship always means some preacher's going to be put down. And when you put down a preacher, you're, you're putting down a gift of God to a congregation. We have become and are still like the scum of the world. The refuse. He's scum and refuse. He said, rather than, rather than going around touting your favorite preacher, you ought to be praying for all of us that God would strengthen us and help us to be faithful to the task and finish well. That's Paul's admonition to them. So, this necessity then of evangelical humility. This, this, this is the remedy to it. This is the but this, this is the antitoxin to pride. And we find it in something else Paul wrote in Philippians 2. We know he thought this way because it comes from his pen. When he says things like, verse 2, complete my joy. You see, these Corinthians falsely thought that, that, they would, that Peter would be joyful to hear that they pref some preferred him, that Apollos would be filled with joy to hear that some preferred him, or that Paul himself would be filled with joy. Complete my joy, Paul says to the Philippians, by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. There's that pride again. But in humility... There's the antidote. Count others more significant than yourself. In other words, if you apply that to Corinth, then it would mean that the person who felt like Peter was the better preacher would, would yield with deference and say, you know, God just used him to bless me in an unusual way. But all of them were blessed. They would not push their own interests. Humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests. You don't... You don't just completely shut down. Then you become a burden to others if you do that. But also to the interest of others. Have this mind, and here's the meat of the matter. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. You see, when you take this, what he's teaching the Philippians about true humility, Christ-likeness, and apply it to Corinth, they should take the teaching of Christ that each of these ones gave to them and ask the Spirit to help them to cultivate a mindset like Christ Jesus. And then Paul, of course, describes this. You know this. He was in the form of God. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He wasn't, he wasn't clinging tenaciously to, to his role in deity, in, in glory. He willingly turned loose. He emptied himself of all his divine prerogatives, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself to become obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He says, that should be your mindset. Humbly, taking what you've learned from Peter, taking what you've learned from Paul, taking what you've learned from Apollos, and use it to advance the gospel and to serve others. Rather than putting yourself forward as the expert on preachers. He says, of course, God has exalted him, bestowed on him the name above every name, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. You see, these people are Christ followers, and they're not, they're not bowing. 
They're strutting. You bow. You bow. Evangelical humility is absolutely necessary in the life of a Christ follower. And God teaches it in different ways from his word and experience. I won't go into it now if the time is late, but you can ask Josh about the journey God gave him this past week at camp. Where he got to, as, as I read one time, when you face a difficult providence of God, hug the cactus. And Josh got to hug the cactus this past week. I'll let him tell you that story. The church will not be like Jesus Christ if it's driven by prideful people. If prideful people get to, get to turn the reins, if prideful people get to push and insist on their own way, I'll tell you what, Jesus will finally take his hand off such a place because it's so antithetical to who he is. I want to close with this today. Isaiah 66, 1 and 2, the last chapter of the, of the prophecy of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? What is the place of my rest? The idea that, you could, that we could build something where God could, could dwell within it. All these things, my hand is, anything, anything you would erect traces back to my hand, he said. So all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this, this is the one to whom I will look. Oh, I pray. I pray the Lord sees me like this. I pray that he sees you like this. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. The Corinthians were not trembling at the word of God. Paul said it in the first part of this passage. Don't go beyond what is written. They were trampling underfoot what was written. The humble person, the contrite spirit there, the person who, who is, who's pricked in his heart when he discovers sin, who trembles at the word, that healthy fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord, his, his, his word, His way, His religion, which is the beginning of wisdom. It was, it was missing in Corinth. We must be sure, first of all individually, and then as those who lead, as those who serve, as those who are part of this family of faith, there is no insignificant member of this family of faith. We must be sure that we are seeking God's wisdom, trembling at his word, daring not to cross it. We must, we must remember Jesus Christ, our gospel, that he humbled himself. He became one of us, that he might die for us. He, he kept the whole law for his people. He suffered the punishment due unto the sins of his people. He took upon himself our sin. He endured God's wrath for sin. And he died satisfying God's wrath by his suffering and death in our place. Rising three days later, vindicating everything he said he was, everything he said he would do. Showing it infallibly true. Remember Jesus Christ. And my prayer for me, my prayer for you, is that when God sweeps his eyes across this area, that he will see one after another humble, humble, contrite, sensitive about sin, who reads the word and trembles with a desire not to bring shame to the Lord and a desire to bring glory to and a desire to be more and more like Jesus Christ. It's absolutely necessary. Humility is. Not denying the power God has placed in each one of us, but acknowledging that God is the source of that power, and we are not.
Not denying what God has taught us, but acknowledging that he has taught us and we haven't figured it out ourselves. I called you. As I've taken a look in the mirror at myself this week, I called you to follow Jesus Christ, growing in humility, being conformed more and more to him, having that mind in him. There's something very powerful about such a people, such a posture. God inhabits that. He invades that. He uses that. And my prayer is that he will use you and me in days to come as we humble ourselves before him like we've not ever known before. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we bow before you today in Jesus' name. We, we see this passage. We see the Corinthians, Lord. Oh, God. Drive from us any any hint of a party spirit and replace it with, with a growing sense of, of, that, of that oneness, that same mind, that same love. Help us to rightly estimate and appreciate your gifts and thank you for using your gifts in your way for your glory in the advance of your gospel. I thank you for these dear people here. I pray that we may all have a servant heart toward one another, blessing one another, encouraging one another, provoking one another to love and good works. And for those among us who are not yet followers of Jesus Christ, I pray that, that in such an atmosphere, the aroma of Christ would be so compelling that they would cry out unto him in repentance and faith and be saved. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.